Hello everyone, welcome to episode 2 of our podcast series, We are the Women of Nedbank CIB. In this series, uh, we'll be speaking about the women of CIB, about women issues in their field of business or their personal lives. And we hope you enjoyed our first episode um, and please share your feedback with us. But in today's episode, we'll bring a more direct focus on the DEI lens um, into the conversation, a very important pillar in the Nedbank CIB strategy. Um, and joining me for this podcast today is Hajira Ahmed, Head of Property Finance Operations, um, who will be unpacking what it means to be a Muslim woman in the industry, representation, growth, development, some of the challenges she has faced, and of course, some wins. And alongside Hajira, we have Tanis Drake, AML, CFT and Sanctions Manager, um, talking about the importance of male allyship and support. So welcome, ladies. Thank you for joining me today. Um, so ladies, for those who might not know you, uh, maybe give us a brief introduction into yourself. Maybe Hajira will start with you and then go on to Tanis, just for the ladies who are going to be listening who don't know you. Okay. So I've joined um, CIB into in 2022, okay. May of 2022, after a 12-year break from Nedbank. Um, I was here previously from 2000, I left 2008 after being here for 10 years. And um, after Return 12 years, soldier. I'm back. Mm. Yes, mm. and very happy to be back. Well, welcome back. We're happy to have you back. Tanith. I uh, actually started in GT. Uh, and then CIB said that they would like to take me in. So I've been there for the last four years, but I'm I'm enjoying it. It's good. Okay. And how long have you been at the bank? Um, oh, so I say that like it's a long time. It's not. <laughs> uh, 2017, I originally joined, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Very nice. Now, without wasting any time, let's get into the business of the day and start talking about the co- uh, the podcast. And Adria, I'd actually like um, to start with you. So... I'm sure you've encountered some difficulties along your journey. One, um, you know, you are a woman. And two, being a Muslim woman. What have been some of your challenges, maybe misconceptions that you may have encountered um, being a Muslim woman and also wearing a hijab? So a common rhetoric in the mass media is that, you know, wearing a hijab is a symbol of of oppression. Um, you know, this piece of cloth that you wear on your head is that you merely submissive to, to male figures in your life. Um, that's actually not the reality. People are often surprised to know that I'm actually wearing this hijab out of my own volition. It's a personal choice that I've made. And and it's really, uh, it's our sense of freedom. It's, it's, a, it's symbolic of who we are. Mm. It's about um, adherence to our faith mm. and our belief system. Absolutely. And... Um, the, the reality is actually that millions of women have to do this out of their own. And um, it's not because we are forced to. Mm. Mm. Um, it, it's, it, it really showcases, um, you know, our, our belief system is for women is that we showcase strength. And um, it's really our, de- our de- identity. I love that. Um People are surprised in the workplace that, you know what, when, when they get to talk to you, that this is a choice that you make daily when you leave your home and um, that it's not something that is forced on you. Do you ever get asked, why do you wear that? Um, not really, hey. Okay. I, okay. I think people are scared yeah, to ask. Yeah, they're scared to ask, yeah. I, I think people are scared to ask, but um, you, you can actually, sometimes people wonder, you know. You can and, tell. And I must, mm. A challenge for me is really that wearing a headscarf and, and this happened a couple of months ago when I had to go do regional visits and um, I was at the airport and um, I was the only one that was actually stopped and they searched me from head to toe they went through my baggage and um, that is what we, we have to deal with on a daily basis yeah. you know um, it, it's actually sad mm, but it's it something is. that I'm used to um, I did ask at the airport, why, why are we being searched? And, and they, they told me, no, this is protocol. They're just follow, following the process. Um, you know, as I went up to the lounge, I stood at the window and I looked and no one else was actually searched. Just you. And, and you know what it is also is that that was just before the LGBTQT uh, march. And I think this is what they, the process that they put in place at the airports. 
because I think they thought there was going to be a threat. And very often people perceive that because you're wearing hijab, you must be a terrorist. It's actually not the case. You know, so so that is one of the challenges that I find in the, in not just in the workplace, in my personal my personal yeah, life as well. Sure. That I'm constantly having to to dispel that notion or that um, theory that all Muslims are terrorists or you're wearing hijab, so you must be a terrorist. Yeah. So it's really about um, behaving in a manner to disprove that, you know, conducting yourself in that manner so that people can understand. Because um, very few people actually ask you a question about why do you wear hijab? or anything about your, your belief system. That's why I asked you, because I know and they won't. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And people think that, um, you know, what is difficult to dispel is that um, you need to basically, people hold the, the opinion that you believe that because you're the minority, that you 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 disbelieve in, in other people's rights. And um, you know you don't hold, you don't respect other people's values because you are a certain because you have a certain faith, which is not actually the truth. We we respect everybody's um, choices that they make in life, uh, whatever, whatever that may be, you know. And it's um, Islam is a very tolerant religion. It is, um, and you know I think that's what we're trying to do with this podcast series is to. We may not be able to educate the whole world, but let's make where we work and come to work every day one that embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion in every way, shape, or form, and maybe hope to answer some of the questions that people have been wondering but too afraid to ask you. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. So, and I mean, how do you how do you move through this? How do you get, you know, continue to move with such grace um, in the midst of all these challenges? It's it's really just about um, building confidence within. Mm. I firmly believe that, um, you know, the, the the opinions of others and what people actually think. Does it, I make a conscious effort not to believe that mm. and buy into that. I'm free and I'm independent of other people's opinions. Um, I tell my that I tell myself that all the time. And I draw on that because if you are going to take note of everything that people tell you, um, it will just break you down. It will. I always tell myself I have to consciously shut it out. Yes. Um, even though you're so aware of it and you're hypersensitive to it, just shut it out. Um, it's the only way you can be yourself and show up as your true self. Um, Absolutely. In the face of all of it. Yeah. It's about being authentic, right? Totally. And And it's also about understanding that People are allowed to have their opinions and, and respect their opinions, yeah, yeah. you know. So um, you don't have to internalize that. No, no, you don't. Uh, but it's important to be aware of it so you can block it. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how have you felt supported and encouraged inside CIB? Well, I must tell you the story. When, when I just started here, um, it was the time when... We just came back to the office, yeah. Um, and I think it was decided that we're having a hybrid model. And I think the first point of order that my manager actually seemed to was that, do I have a place to perform my daily rituals during working hours? Um, Michelle went out of her way to make sure that the prayer facility was sorted out. She liaised with facilities. She made sure she went up there. She took photos. She took it personally. <laughs> she, yes, she took photos and um, sent it to facilities, made sure that they painted and cleaned and vacuumed um, and gave him three weeks to make sure that it was done. And that for me was amazing. Absolutely, no one's ever done that for me. And that made me feel really included and part of the CIB community. Absolutely amazing. And I think it's also important for people to speak up about what they need. Yes. Often we don't say what we need, so something can't be done. But um, we have to give people the opportunity to help us too. For sure. Yeah, yeah, lovely. You know, um, we're very fortunate to be part of an organization that supports us so wholeheartedly. Um, and, and so maybe, Tanith, let's switch gears a bit and talk to you and about where, the space you're working in. 
it's quite male dominated. Um, has it worked to your advantage or not? Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I work up until recently, we've had some changes, but up until recently, I was the only female in my team. Wow. And um, <laughs> and it's, no, it's it's been a very positive experience for me. Um, the, the running joke is that uh, my team constitute husband two, three, and four for me. Number one, obviously being at home. Work husband. And that's it. And um, and I'm and I'm their work wife collectively. And it's and while it's not a new anecdote by any means, we very much operate um, as as a very tight team. And I am definitely deferred to in those aspects um, of characteristics that be considered inherently more female. As an example, being detail orientated. And so my colleagues will lean into that. So if that means that they have to label documents and um, put SharePoints together in a specific way because I said so, then that's what they do. And they don't kick and they don't fight and they don't dismiss my opinions in that way. Um, I'm treated as nothing more, um, sorry, as nothing less than an equal. Um, and even even my opinions, they're never dismissed even if I very passionately express those opinions. So I do. I work with a, with a really great um, group of men. Amazing. Why do you think it's important to have men as allies in a workplace? Look, um, simply they're fifty percent of the population. So, um, as helps with, to have the numbers. That's it. <laughs> as as with any change, the yeah. more people that you have in it, the better that change is going to be affected. Uh, when I was first approached about this podcast endeavor, the f- the very first thing I did is I went to my male colleagues, emailed them, and I said, "Guys, I'm going to be a celebrity, but I don't know what to talk about." <laughs> <laughs> And um, and they came back and they said, oh, and you have some topics and try these oh, and what about you. this? I oh, love no, that. They helped me. Um, and 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 ultimately, the topic that we landed on is I, I phoned uh, Tato and I said, listen, I still don't know what to talk about. And she said something to celebrate. And I said, oh, I work with a great, great group of men. And she said, why don't you talk about that? Um, and so I think it's superb that the first bit of support that I looked for was my male colleagues and I immediately received it. I love that. I mean, we live in a society where we see gender equality at the forefront. It's a topic that's being spoken about everywhere. And uh, we certainly work in an environment um, where we support it. And um, Anel is a big supporter of it and many of the other leaders in the organization. Why do you think men should have a vested interest in empowering women? Because they do have a vested interest in empowering women. Men have wives and sisters and daughters and grandmothers. They have people that they love dearly and they want to see the best for. Um, A man who uh, has a wife who needs to go on maternity leave and he wants her to be supported by her colleagues is a man who's going to support his colleagues who go on maternity leave. A man who wants to see his daughter do well in her career is going to be a man who's going to support the careers of young women in his own line of work. Men should have a vested interest in empowering women because they do have a vested interest in empowering women. Mm. Directly impacts them and every woman they know. That's it. Yeah, interesting. We are ever can't shy away from the fact that more needs to be done. Where does it start? How can we start doing it more inside CIB? I mean, the place we can impact it the most. How do we bring more men into the conversations and, and actions around empowering women? For me, it started home. I, I grew up in quite a traditional household. My, my dad was a guy born in the 1950s and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And, and yet, between my sister and my brother and I, where if there were chores, whether it was dishwashing or painting a garage door, they were equally doled out. And as a result, when I bounded off to university to go and, and do my degree and, and, and jump into the world, I never considered being um, a female to be a, a problem or a hindrance in any way. And it was only really once I'd qualified that my grandmother, she left for joy because, you know, her granddaughter had got an accounting qualification, which was something in her generation, which was a bit harder to come by as a woman. And that was the first instance that I thought, oh, sure, okay, so this, you know, this maybe is a bit different. So, um, and I think that awareness is good, but I wouldn't change the way I was brought up because it, it allowed me to go into the world and break the mold without feeling that hindrance. And how do you do that and take those lessons you learned in your childhood and spread that further inside CIB. I mean, how could we do that? So I think I think it's exactly the same. It's it's not it's not worrying about whether somebody is, is male or female. It's about giving them that equal opportunity and treating everybody with that respect mm. and and are based on their individual ability. Mm. So if you can do it, do it. Mm. And I also think calling it out um 
and men sit in meetings with women every day. If you see her being spoken over or not getting a turn to speak for whatever reason or you think there's some prejudice, call it out. Um, say something. You have, you can do that and you can do that for her. Absolutely. Had you any, any thoughts from you on this um, topic? For me, I think it's very important that as women, we, spo- we support other women through, through development, through coaching, and we have to help each other succeed. And um, in a man's world, being show- that being showcased and the success will encourage other younger generations and generations before them, you know, to, to succeed as well. Research has um, indicated that um, if a child sees themselves growing up and representative, um, they are the anomaly, you know, if they succeed. And the expectation if they fail. So for me, that is very important for our future generations. Mm -hmm. Totally. I couldn't agree more. This has been a very insightful and enlightening conversation, ladies. Um, I hope our our listeners took away um, something from this conversation um, and that they can also actively do things in in assisting their fellow colleagues with struggles that they may be going through. Um, So thank you for joining us and for listening in on this episode. And we'll see you next week for our third episode of We Are the Women of CIB. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, Hajira. It was lovely having you here today. Thank you. Thank you.